Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Baltimore. And welcome to the first in his first series of reports on the Israeli economy and the economics of occupation. And joining us now from Germany is Shir Hever. As I say, he's an economist. He studies the Israeli occupation of the Palestinian territories for the Alternative Information Center, a joint Palestinian-Israeli organization dedicated to publishing alternative information and analysis. Thanks for joining us, Shir. Thank you, Paul. So, so let's start this series of reports talking, obviously, about the recent Israeli attack on Gaza. Uh, what, what are the various factors in your view that led to this attack? In many ways, this attack uh, seems like a, a, an irrational attack. There doesn't seem to be any particular reason why Israel suddenly chose to attack Gaza. Certainly, we can see how uh, the Israeli army escalated the violence by uh, first killing a 13-year-old child uh, at the uh, close to the uh, fence around in Gaza and later by assassinating the commander of the uh, military arm of Hamas. And now after eight days of, uh, of pounding Gaza, more than 130 people killed, uh, the ceasefire that was achieved uh, doesn't really change the situation in any significant way uh, to what it was before. So in many ways, uh, people wonder why this entire attack was even necessary. And also from the point of view of the Israeli economy, the Israeli side of things, this attack caused quite a lot of damage, not to be compared with the massive damage caused to Gaza, but uh, but still from uh, the point of view of uh, uh, losses in the in the billions of shekels, that, that means uh, hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, a lot of people who, who were not able to go to school, to go to work uh, during this conflict. Before you kind of get into the more the political economic analysis of this, analysis of this, one theory that's being floated, and I don't know if you have the expertise to answer this, but I wonder what you think, is that Israel wanted to actually find out whether this Iron Dome defense system worked and what the rocket capacity of Hamas actually was, uh, suggest, people are suggesting in preparation for some possible war with Iran, that if all hell broke loose, uh, how, how, what would Israeli defenses be like? What, what do you make of that? I think we have to separate it into two things. Uh, whether Israel wanted to know what are the military capabilities of Hamas, that's really not the way to find out, and uh, I don't think that's how they would go about finding out, uh, by starting a conflict and seeing what Hamas can, can uh, launch at them. Uh, there, that's why there's intelligence, and that's uh, and for that purpose, they have other means. I think testing the capabilities of Iron Dome is more important. But of course, in order to test the capabilities of this technology, they don't need Hamas. They can also use test rockets. The reason that they wanted to use Iron Dome in this context is because uh, this was not a test for the internal research and development teams of the military industries. This was a show for the rest of the world and for armies around the world what this uh, uh, unit is capable of doing. Uh, and of course, this will be translated immediately into sales. Iron Dome was developed by a company called uh, Rafael. Rafael is a uh, state-owned company, although many of its factories have already been sold uh, to private contractors, uh, to, to, to private companies, and many of the components uh, in, in the system are actually produced by private companies. And these companies are uh, gradually becoming Israel's, uh, one of Israel's most important forms of export. Uh, and Israel is uh, well known around the world for uh, being a country that produces uh, a state-of-the-art military uh, technology, especially in the field of, of unmanned drones, in the field of uh, uh, optical systems, and now also in the field of uh, anti-rocket uh, um, units, uh, uh, anti-rocket uh, missiles. The Iron Dome um, was a, a cost, cost the Israeli government a lot of money. And if you compare the cost of those makeshift rockets that uh, Hamas is putting together from pipes and homemade uh, explosives, um, each of them is estimated to cost about $100, $150. And you compare it to the Iron Dome system, which uh, launches $50,000 uh, missiles in, into the air trying to intercept those uh, Hamas rockets and have to launch several of those in order to, to effectively uh, um, intercept the Hamas rockets, then it's, it's ridiculous uh, um, in terms of costs. But uh, the Israeli government is bearing the costs. When this uh, um, system will be uh, also bought by the U.S. Army, by the uh, British Army, and by other uh, countries around the world, uh, then the profits are not going to go uh, uh, into the pockets of the Israeli government, into the Israeli treasury, but it's going to go to those private companies. 
so we can see those people who are also profiting from the attack. Um, I think these uh, uh, these companies that profit from from war, from conflict, are becoming more and more influential in Israeli politics. What are other examples of the privatization of Israeli security? I think the main uh, example we see in the checkpoints, uh, the the large checkpoints uh, surrounding the Gaza Strip and inside the West Bank have been all privatized uh, into the hands of private security companies, partially because Israel doesn't have enough soldiers to maintain those checkpoints. So now you have these private security companies who are operating these checkpoints. And these private security companies are not content to be contractors for the Israeli Ministry of Defense, but they're also uh, uh, trying to export their expertise and uh, uh, offering their services to airports around the world, to uh, secure, uh, train uh, security forces. Um, right now, uh, there's, there are many, many contracts in Brazil in preparation for the next uh, Soccer World Cup, um, buying uh, unmanned drones and uh, um, expertise from, from Israeli uh, private uh, companies. Um, so the whole privatization of security has many faces to it. And the idea, of course, is not just uh, to, to provide these new technologies to show that they work and to sell them. The idea is also to try to, to change the entire way in which the world is economically and socially constructed uh, and to offer a kind of alternative management system for the wealthy countries, for the uh, hegemonic countries in the world, uh, by which they can keep the world, uh, the, the wealthy part of the, of, of the human race in a state of gated community. And hi hiring gated. Israeli companies to help them do this work. Yeah, this is the concept of Fortress Israel. Fortress, and, and the recent attack on Gaza was an example, how you uh, um, have a Fortress Israel, which means um, a country that has uh, makes absolutely no attempt to resolve it diplom its diplomatic and political problems, makes no attempt to try to find a solution to the occupation, to end the occupation, to, to achieve uh, peace with its neighbors. Uh, that that has been off the agenda of the Israeli government for years, and and this was the this is the main motto uh, that uh, the Israeli government has been repeating uh, um, time after time. There is no partner for peace. There's no one to talk to, um, because they want to to uh, stress that there is another alternative. Instead of talking with your neighbors, instead of uh, recognizing the rights and and uh, achieving uh, peace, uh, you could simply maintain a sort of military superiority that will always um, give you security in all situations, even during a situation of conflict. Right. Now, there was some what, also what we a lot of discussion the, about the domestic politics of all this. Well, what, what, yeah. What's your thoughts on that? Netanyahu is um, in a very interesting and, and um, a unique situation in a way, because on the one hand, he does not really have any contenders. That, to, that can compete with him. There is, there is no political leader in Israel who uh, is anywhere near as popular as Netanyahu and, and likely to be able to form a government. So the upcoming election seemed to be a, a sure thing for Netanyahu. But then uh, Netanyahu started to suffer a series of setbacks, mainly from the economic side of things, because Israel has a very serious crisis of inequality and growing poverty and a very serious housing problem and cost of living problem, which is uh, eroding the middle class. A lot of people are very concerned about the economic situation and there were quite uh, a massive social uh, protests in the last uh, um, two summers, um, which are growing in, in their ability to, to affect the, the public perception about priorities, what, what the government is supposed to, to give to the public. And Netanyahu realizes that he cannot really meet the demands of the protest movement and at the same time continue his policy of supporting the illegal uh, colonization of the West Bank and strengthening the army um, and strengthening his uh, corporate bodies. Uh, so Netanyahu actually declared he's not going to reveal his uh, budget for the next year until the election. And he had to push the election a bit earlier uh, just so that his government will not fall for not approving the budget so he can keep the budget secret until after the election. Uh, well, of course, this is pretty big news, and a lot of Israelis uh, would would ser seriously consider not voting for someone who, who refuses to reveal their upcoming bu budget and where they're planning to cut, whether it's education or health or other uh, public services. Um, but um, 
this attack on Gaza uh, served Netanyahu by completely changing the, the discourse and putting all the social uh, issues on the back seat uh, uh, and, and out of the headlines of the um, mainstream media. Uh, suddenly people were only talking about the, the war, the danger, the, the conflict, Hamas. And in that sense, Netanyahu doesn't have anyone who can compete with him because he's uh, joined forces with the extreme right party, uh, uh, Israel Beitenu, who's uh, headed by uh, Avigdor Lieberman, Israel's uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, an extreme right wing politician. Anything more to the right than, uh, than Netanyahu and Lieberman is, is the abyss. There is, there is actually almost no, nothing mo further to the right. And anything, uh, all the Zionist parties to the left are not really to the left. None of the Zionist parties uh, have condemned the attack on Gaza. None of them has suggested that maybe there was a nonviolent way to resolve the problem. And how do you explain, the, the, if, if these reports are correct, the overwhelming, it seems, support from the Israeli public for the attack on Gaza? There seems to be a, a, quite a consolidation of, of this view. This is, a, unfortunately, a tried and true way to get the Israeli public um, to forget everything else. Uh, there is such a strong um, element of indoctrination in the Israeli uh, schooling system that when it comes to war, when it comes to uh, matters of security, we all have to stand together, we all have to be one front. And um, any kind of politician who would say, for example, this attack on Gaza could, could be harmful for Israel, could not, m maybe doesn't serve Israel's interests in the best way, and there could have been a a different way that Israel should have handled itself in this situation. Um, any politician who would say that would be called a traitor, would be called a softy, um, and uh, would lose a lot of popularity. Uh, and that's something that the leaders of the social protest were completely aware of. And during the last uh, uh, two years, during the summers, uh, um, summer demonstrations, they held signs uh, and on the signs they said, we won't allow, uh, let you uh, uh, distract us with another war. We won't let you talk about attack attacking Iran uh, instead of uh, uh, dealing with the, with the socioeconomic problems that, that we, are, uh, we, we demand you address. And just to remind viewers that may not have followed the story, we, we carried quite a few stories, but some of these protests were in the hundreds of thousands of people on the streets. The largest one was half a million people. Um, and um, this, is, uh, uh, this is unprecedented in Israel. Um, nevertheless, when the uh, guns are roaring, the, the protests uh, immediately collapse. Mm. Uh, and um, there is a kind of divide and conquer sort of feeling because uh, the, the rockets fired by Hamas cannot reach all parts of Israel equally. Uh, some people feel more safer than others. Some people receive compensation from the state and some people receive less. Mm -hmm. And immediately this sort of bickering um, creates a situation where if someone from, from Tel Aviv would say, you know, we should uh, think about cost of housing because cost of housing in Tel Aviv is so high, you cannot get an apartment there for, um, for any reasonable price. Then someone from the south, closer to Gaza, who's under more uh, uh, severe uh, uh, bombardment would say, you don't have any right to speak until you come to Gaza and this is more urgent, uh, come, come to the south, this is more urgent, we, we are living in a state of constant fear, right. so our problem takes precedence. And as soon as you get into this sort of discussion, then it creates, uh, um, it, it, it actually silences the political debate. And, once, uh, and as long as U.S. policy continues as one-sidedly in support of Israel as it has been and is, I suppose there's no reason for Israel to do any differently. The U.S. policy played a very important role in this attack because uh, I think um, Obama, prior to the election in the U.S., was, was uh, uh, genuinely concerned that Israel might make a unilateral attack against Iran, which would drive up oil prices all around the world and could ruin Obama's chance of re-election. Um, I don't know exactly whether he used some kind of pressure to prevent Israel from attacking Iran, whether that was the decisive factor in uh, the, uh, um, Israel not attacking Iran. But um, the fact that Obama was re-elected in the US was something that Netanyahu was certainly betting against. And uh, every, everyone knew Netanyahu was supporting Romney. Uh, and the fact that uh, uh, Romney lost 
uh, meant that a lot of people also um, lost some of their respect for Netanyahu because he seemed to, he bet on the wrong horse. He um, he then appeared to be a, a sort of opponent of Obama, and maybe Israel's U.S. relations would not be so good. I think the attack against Gaza uh, is and uh, also in response to Obama's re-election because Netanyahu realizes he cannot really attack Iran under the, under the circumstances. He needs a victory because he wants to be a hero before the elections. And he knows that attacking Gaza would, would uh, still give him the full support of the U.S. Obama was uh, visiting uh, Burma and just released a statement that uh, Israel has a right to defend itself and, and any country has a right to defend itself from rockets co coming mm -hmm. uh, from outside its borders. Obama, of course, forgot um, that uh, uh, Palestinians also have a right to defend themselves. And he also forgot that the rockets coming from Gaza are not coming from outside of Israel's borders because Israel controls Gaza. Uh, Gaza is a, a part of, the, of Israel's sphere of control. Uh, and in fact... Um, uh, his his very empty statement um, just uh, uh, boldens Israel to continue to to disregard uh, international law and to disregard right. human life. Right. Thanks very much for joining us, Shir. And as I mentioned, this is the beginning of a series of reports. Shir is going to come join us every couple of weeks and update us on the situation in Israel. Thanks for joining us, Shir. Thank you very much, Paul. And thank you for joining us on the Real News Network. And if you do want to see more interviews and reports like this. Don't forget, we're in the middle. There's a donate button over here. That's why I'm pointing. Uh, we're in the midst of our year-end fundraising campaign. Every dollar you donate will get matched until we reach $100,000. And if you want to see more real news in 2013, we need you to click on that. Thanks very much for joining us on the Real News Network.